Can y'all hear that when it says that? Recording in progress? Yes, sir. Okay, just wondering. We also get a pop-up notification. Okay, yeah, it's up at the top left hand side that it's recording on my screen. Um okay. Uh well, first off, I'll just say I appreciate everyone being here and and um I had a phone call yesterday from a minister and asking me a question about um, scriptures in Matthew 12. Let me go there here. Um, Matthew 12 and let see where that, let's see if it's, yes, Matthew 12 and 31. Um, I'm going to go there right quick on my screen, and then I'll share it. Here, um, where do you do that? There you go. Okay, Jesus here, he, he had healed a person that was, in fact, he cast out a spirit out of them. And they were, uh, they were uh, mute. Let me back up here and see where it says. They brought unto him, verse 22 right here. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And that interesting that he was possessed with the devil and Jesus healed him. Uh, and all the people were amazed and said, it's not, it's not this the son of David. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first find the strong man? And then he'll spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. <laughs> That's where I gave that little story years ago when I was in Cisco, Texas, that there was an old old brother there that was there that night. He was he got up and he was preaching to us and he said, he told us, he said, uh, if you're not saved when you go to hell, he said, there will be angels there, I mean demons, and they'll have uh They'll have whips and they'll give everybody a board. And he said, because the scripture says that, and he, he quoted this scripture, uh, he that's not with me is against me and he gathereth not with me, scattereth abroad. But he read that, scratcheth a board. <laughs> and so he said that, uh, these demons would give everybody a board and they'd have a whip and, and they'd tell you to scratch that board. And you'd scratch that board and them, the splinters would go up underneath your fingernails till your fingernails was bleeding and you'd cry and want to stop. And when you slowed down, they'd hit you with that whip and say, scratch that board, boy. <laughs> this guy was so serious. That, and we was, uh, the congregation was doing their best to just, you know, hold steady and not laugh. But they finally couldn't hold it. I mean, it, people got to laughing and it made him mad, you know. He said, that's all right. Y'all will be scratching a board. 
<laughs> no straight love. Anyway, this was the scripture that he used. Uh, needless to say, that's not my topic tonight. Anyway, Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin, this is my scripture, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Um, if, you, if you go to Mark, let's go to Mark. Um, I'm going to go to Mark 13. No, Mark 3. Let me back up. I believe that's in Mark 3 that I'm wanting. He's a little stronger in his saying here, how it's recorded. Uh, let's see where he says that. Let me go back up here. Where did I just read in 13? What verse did I read there? Was I in, I was in Mark 12, uh, Matthew 12, wasn't it? That's where I'm having to go. I think it was in 14. Yeah, it's here it is. Okay. I'm kind of shooting from the hip here tonight, so. Yeah, Mark 3.28. I think y'all can see this over on the right-hand side. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies, whithersoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but it is in danger of eternal damnation. I think uh, over here in um, yeah, in the 32nd verse here, the way he says it is, Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So um, if you'll now go to, with, I mean, you just follow me here. I'm going to go to John 5. And 16, right here, let me see. Yeah. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All righteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So <clears throat> here I've made a note on, on this particular scripture for some time back it's in my notes. If somebody wants, wants these notes, I'll copy them and send them to them. But I but here, here's the verse. Here, this verse is referring to the sin that is unto eternal death, as well as the sin that is not unto eternal death. The following scriptures offer understanding. Of course, I've got this scripture in Matthew 12, where Jesus was showing, it's a little bit, you know, difficult to explain because in some ways, when you first read what Jesus said, that you can blaspheme, you speak against the Son of God, but if you speak against the Holy Ghost, uh, you won't be forgiven. 
Now, uh, there are scriptures we have to take into consideration of what's being said here. Number one, there's plenty of people that spoke against Jesus that, that got forgiveness for it, which he said they could. And of course, that was while he was here on the earth. But the Holy Ghost hadn't been given. It wasn't given till after the day of Pentecost. And there were all kinds of blasphemies that took place. He said, you can get forgiveness from, but when you speak against the Holy Ghost, uh, see, they were rejecting Christ there. Um, the Jews were rejecting him and, uh, and said all manner of things against him. He said, you can get forgiveness for that. But if you speak against the Holy Ghost, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, uh, the first time I really got understanding on this on this scriptural setting that I'm going I'm bringing up here was through Brother Ray Linegar, uh, and I've never heard another man speak on it in the same way. But and I believe exactly what he taught. I believe it's the only thing I've ever heard that made any sense. What he, the way he described it was this. After the day of Pentecost, I'm, I'm going into a little bit more detail than I ever heard him actually say, but I got what he said. After the day of Pentecost, a, a sevenfold light was ushered into the kingdom of heaven, and there was a full manifestation of God. If you rejected that, there was no hope for you. That was, this is eternal judgment, what it's talking about. Now, it's not talking about rejecting it and not changing, because we can take the case on Apostle Paul. He rejected the operation of the Holy Ghost in the early church. Um, he saw Christians, he, he saw to it they were placed in prison. Some of them were even killed. Uh, uh, that's why he called himself the chiefest sinner among the apostles. But when God touched him and he, and he received, he was able to receive God's touch in his life, he no longer rejected the operation of the spirit of the Holy Ghost. And therefore, of course, he was not only saved, but he was a chosen vessel. Now, John said, I don't say you pray for this sin if it's unto death. That will, will carry it a little bit further under what John was saying. Um, because we could, we'd have to go back to Adam. Adam sinned a sin unto death. In other words, Adam received too much, he received so much knowledge that there was no repentance for his knowledge and him making up his mind to reject God. He knew, he knew that when he rejected God, even though he didn't know what death, he never seen death. He didn't know what corruption of sin, he never saw it, but he had the knowledge of it. And that's why when he, when he committed sin, he committed sin under eternal judgment. He committed sin unto death. Um, so here in these two settings in, in uh, Matthew 12 and Mark 3, uh, I've got wrote here, Mark, Mark 3, 28 and 29 states somewhat stronger that the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost would put a person in danger of eternal damnation or eternal judgment. Um, let me go on a little bit further in what I was saying about Brother Leniger's statement on this. In other words, the full manifestation of God was presented in the early church. And if you rejected that and, and blasphemed it, that, and, and he would say it this way, nobody here has ever, ever committed that type of blasphemy because we've never had a restored church or had what the early church had. But if God manifested his spirit, the spirit of his fullness to you and you rejected it, you would meet eternal judgment. There wouldn't be any hope for you. Um, 
that uh, if you if you died back there, see people before that that were God's children that died, they they either died just or unjust. Um, <clears throat> because there was not an there was an eternal judgment. But during the early church, when a sevenfold line existed, there was eternal judgment. And if you died under that judgment and didn't accept Christ and the body of Christ, then you would be eternally judged. There wouldn't be, you, you wouldn't come up even in the final resurrection as one of the unjust because what more could God show you if he's already showed you everything that he can show you? And that was manifested in the early church. One of the things I taught on here not too long ago was I taught on all the scriptures in the New Testament that showed that the, the gospel during the early church was preached to that known entire known world and all the scriptures that apply to the script the the gospel being preached to the whole world was fulfilled back there in that world and I, I want to talk on that again in fact I'm I, I hope the Lord will let me talk on that in a general meeting or a minister's meeting because uh, there's men, ministers right now in the body preaching that we got to preach this gospel to the whole world, and they use those scriptures. They're using scriptures that were fulfilled in the early church. It will be preached to this whole known world. That's not including every nation and everybody. It only includes those people that are in the Gentile world that God has chosen to make up his bride out of. And so uh, this sin unto death now, when we go back to this sin unto death, that is a sin that when you have reached a place, so you, you can take a person right now that is, let's just say that they've left the body of Christ and death is reigning in their life, but not eternal death not eternal judgment. Brother Leninger, in the last couple of years of his life, he began to talk about every sign of God has a right to the Supreme Court. <laughs> he, he used that analogy of the Supreme Court to show that, and he was using this analogy of a Supreme Court as a divine order of the early church or the restored church down here. And if you weren't, if you're not living during that time, if you weren't living during the time of the early church prior to AD 70, after the day of Pentecost, but prior to AD 70, then you would have to come up either just or unjust because uh, you, you couldn't be eternally judged if there wasn't an eternal judgment seat set up which that's what Paul called the judgment seat of Christ. And so, uh, and, and some of the things I'm giving you tonight is, is why I do not believe that you can reach perfection outside of a full sevenfold light manifestation of God, either in the early church or in the restored church then I do believe you could reach perfection any time down through the thousand years because I think the sevenfold light will be will maintain during that thousand years. Or you could reach it in the final res resurrection of the unjust. So we'll, we'll cover some of that here. <clears throat> this, there is a sin unto death. Now see, I was going to say a minute ago, let's take people, let's just take, the Little Rock Church, for example. People that's been in the Little Rock Church that we know have left the church, they're not living for God during the world. They went back into the world. Those people, death is reigning in their life, but they're not sending sin unto eternal death. 
you could pray for that. There is a sin that's not unto eternal death that you could pray and ask God to save them. But if a person has reached a place, and I don't know that we could know this very much without being in a restored church, like those that were in the early church, that uh, there were people that left the body of Christ after receiving a manifest, you know, uh, a, you know, a full manifestation of God. There was an eternal judgment seat back there. Uh, I even said to this minister that called me yesterday, I said, I doubt that Agabus prayed for Paul. Because even when Jesus stopped Agabus and said, I want you to go to this man and pray for him and open his blinded eyes. And, he's, and Agabus said, Lord, do you know who this man is? <laughs> like the Lord maybe wasn't aware of who Paul, how, how, how bad a sinner Paul was against the body of Christ. But Paul told him, uh, you know, my point is, I doubt seriously they were praying for Paul. Um, they might have been praying that he not do any more damage than he done, was doing. But I don't know how many people was actually praying that God had saved him. Because um, I, I imagine most people didn't think he probably could be saved in the spirit he was in. People didn't know that he was a chosen vessel of the Lord. And even the Lord told him, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. There was something in his heart even though he was maintaining strength against the against Christ and against the body of Christ in all of his teachings of Judaism and the Pharisee sect, there was still something that was gripping his heart that he felt like there's something wrong about what we're doing. And there's something about these people that that is is troubling me. And, and it was hard for him to 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 go through with the things he was doing. Uh, he was just that ambitious, I guess. Anyway, uh, if we go here to 1 John 3, 8 through 10, and all of these scriptures I'm giving you would go with these scriptures in Matthew 12, and Mark 3, and John 5. All these scriptures will have to be fitted together to really understand this teaching. John said here in 1 John 3, 8, 9, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. There's, there's, there's two ways you could look at this. One, when you're born of the Spirit of God, you, you can't sin in the Holy Ghost or the new man. Uh, but in Adam, uh, in Adam, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. This, this corrupt nature of Adam that's in us is, is what causes us to sin. Holy Ghost will never cause you to sin. But then if you look at it this way, that once you are fully born of God unto perfection, you can't commit sin at that point. But up until that point, you can. Um, I've always looked at it more that you've got two natures. You've got a sinful nature and you've got a righteous nature of Christ, of the Spirit of God in your life. And, and uh, you, but, but finally, we're to mortify the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit, and we're finally to come to a place where we do not sin. We, we've overcome the nature of the flesh or the corruption, the Adamic nature. Um, you know, there's some things that I've had to consider along the way. Um, 
you know, and it might be, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to hurt anyone, uh, but I'll, but I'll share this thought for your consideration. Um, a minister, a, a very uh, strong leading minister among us made a statement a few years ago, and he said, Jesus could sin now in heaven. And everybody just, you know, were thumbs down on that statement. It's like, my God, what's wrong with this man? I talked to him. I called him aside and talked to him later. And I asked him the question. I said, are you saying that he, he has the ability to sin, but he can't sin because he's got too much wisdom to sin? He said, that's what I'm saying. Well, I never looked at it that way or thought about it, but you might consider it that for you to be you, an individual that has a freedom of free will, that will be perfected in the will of God, which is righteous will. Your will, your will is formed in righteousness and in the nature of God. Therefore, are you when you're when you have inherited eternal life, do you have an ability, a free ability, a free mind? Can you think? Do you remember all the sins you committed? Do you remember the corruption of the flesh? And could you, could you step outside of righteousness? Um, the answer would have to be, no, I couldn't step outside of righteousness. But you might say, I could, but I can't because I understand sin, I understand righteousness, and I've been perfected in righteousness, and I could never commit the smallest sin. I've always described a perfect overcomer as someone that, like if I ask you, Right now, if I said, if we were standing next to a, a fiery furnace, and I said, stick your arm in there, could you do it? Yes, you got the ability to do it. Would you do it? No, you won't do it because you got too much knowledge of the destruction of that fire. And an, a perfect overcomer, the smallest little teensy teensy sin, an overcomer would see the end of that sin as if though it was a tiring inferno that would be so destructive that there's no way that they would dis, they would co commit such a such a thing. Anyway, that's just food for thought for your consideration. The, the bottom line to that is none of us have been perfect. None of us, I doubt if any of us, is, I, I just have to say none of us have seen an overcomer. So we're talking about something we don't know a whole lot about. We're just trying to uh, fathom an understanding about a, perf a perfection. So I wouldn't push any of those thoughts too far beyond what, we have facts to hang them on. Um, okay, so um, now let's go to Hebrews 6. Um, this is very familiar, you know, with everyone that has been in the body very long, but, but I want to read this scripture to you. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgments. And I would say that we pretty well understand the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands, but I don't think we have come to a complete understanding of the resurrection of the dead 
or eternal judgment. I don't think eternal judgment exists, exists yet, won't, until we get to um, a restored church. But that's what I'm teaching on tonight is eternal judgment. That's what I'm talking about. Now he says here in the third verse, and this will we do if God permit. Now look what he says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. It's impossible if they fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, put him to open shame. So here's scripture that tells us that you can reach a place in God that it's impossible if you fall away to be renewed again under repentance. I would say that's a sin unto death. Now let's back up a little bit. In verse four, it says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened. Well, I'd have to think that we have been enlightened. God has touched you and give you a vision. That's an enlightenment. Now, I don't think you've been enlightened, nor have I with a sevenfold light yet. So I think there's more light to come. But Paul's talking here to a church that has received a sevenfold light and tasted the heavenly gift. No doubt that's, that's Christ. He was the gift of salvation to mankind. And I don't know that we've ate the whole lamb yet. Um, we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. I certainly believe we're partakers of the Holy Ghost, but I don't know that we're partakers of the full manifestation of the Holy Ghost yet. We hadn't seen it in its early church manifestation, like Christ was talking about in Matthew 12, and Mark 3, blaspheming that operation and have tasted the good word of God. See, there's we've tasted the word of God, but there's still doctrines that we're not together on, and we can't say that have been, those doctrines have been solidified or that we've come to a ministry, and I'm basically talking about the, 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 the main leading ministry that see eye to eye, the watchmen that see eye to eye, and the powers of the world to come. There's something I don't think we've tasted. I don't think we've lived in a time where God has ever gave any man the power that he gave one of those 12 apostles, that they had dominion. Jesus was given the spirit without measure. He had dominion like, like Adam had. He could speak to the sea. He could talk to a storm. Every element that there was had to obey him. He, was, he had dominion over everything. And I think those apostles have dominion also. Whatsoever things you remit will be remitted. Whatsoever things you, sin you retain will be retained. Uh, God gave those men great power, but I won't say that they had it from the minute that they received the Holy Ghost, but I think they developed to a place that where there were men that God gave power they reached a place that they were, they lived above sin just like Christ did, and they had power on earth and dominion. We're going to have to get back in that place. If we make the bride of Christ, we're going to have to get a place where we can judge with wisdom, righteously, and all things. We can't make mistakes once we've, we're, we're bride members that have that kind of judgment. But I'd say that, you know, some of these men reached perfection before they left this world. Um, so here it says it's impossible to renew these people once they've received all of this that we've talked about. That uh, when you say that Adam 
for God to eternally judge Adam that he reached a place or was in a place, and I'd say he had to reach that place, that he rejected God. He made a decision knowing what the punishment would be, that death would be the punishment. But he still made a decision to turn away from God and into a place that there was no forgiveness. There was no going back to it. Um, Let's see here. Let's go here. Hebrews 10, 26. For, and I, I realize I'm talking about a very serious place in God right now, but I still believe it's scripture that, and we're living in a time that I think we ought to be aware. We ought to be aware that, that we're striving for a place like this. We're striving for a place that we can live above sin, and that we could get to a place where we would never sin again. Um, here, Hebrews 10, verse 26, for if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment? Suppose you shall he be that thought worthy, be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. Brother Leninger taught this sore judgment was eternal judgment. That it's it's that word sore means a more serious judgment. See, under the Moses' law, you died without mercy under two or three witnesses. You could die in sin without um uh, even in the early church, if you hadn't received uh, a place in God yet, that, how did he say that up here? That you would sin willfully. Now, let me say this. I, I, wanna, I want this to be understood because there's no doubt probably the young people listening to me. But even adults, just because someone preaches the truth to you and you hear it, you actually receive it. I'll, I'll have to admit when I was a younger preacher that I, I would, I would, God would touch me in services and I knew I'd, I would really ring the bell, so to speak, that the spirit of God really anointed me. And I could see saints that I knew they got what God was delivering. And I would think that they're, they're responsible. They heard it, they got it, and they better not send, they better not do what I'm teaching against here. But as I got older, I realized that just because you heard it, just because you received it, doesn't really mean you've digested it yet and it's become a part of you. Salvation and truth takes time for it to really take root in a person's soul and become a part of them. Now, I'm not giving you a crutch to sin. I'm not giving you a license here to sin, but I'm, I do know that just because a person's heard a message and maybe, you know, they really got it, they got it, they understand the truth about certain sins and righteous uh, acts of righteousness, and then they don't keep it. I wouldn't put those people in sinning willfully after they receive the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth takes time for it really to be sown in you and rooted in you to where it's become a part of you. But I do believe that you'll grow to a place that you've received the knowledge of the truth to a point that 
I, and, and I'm going to say this, in a restored church or in that early church, I believe there were people that received and uh, came into that place where if they sinned, they would, they, there was no hope for them. They, if they sinned, they sinned to sin unto death. They got too much knowledge to turn on God. And they knew better than what they'd done, and they knew what the violation would bring. Uh, you know, somewhere, if you believe in perfection, you got to believe that there's a place that you reach in God that there's no turning back. You, you, and, and I believe that's in the early church, in the, in the holy place, in second heaven. I don't think you can sin in the holy place. Um, I just don't think that play, I don't think that's available that you get in the holy place and, and, and do wrong while you're in there. I just, and I don't think it's a place that you can go in and out of. I think you can get in the, I think you can get in the white garment. You can, you can put on righteousness. Uh, you can get in a place where you're not sinning, but I don't think you're going to enter into the holy place until you've reached a certain growth in God that, that God's gave you the power to live above sin. Um, uh, and by the way, if anybody's got any questions, you're welcome to ask them. So, um, the, uh, the Ten Commandments where Moses gave the commandment, thou shalt not blaspheme the Lord, thy, blaspheme the name of the Lord. Is that, is that an equivalent to uh, what uh, um, the word escapes me? Um, denying the Holy Ghost? No. It, he he's just he's just talking about if you reject you know what God is the authority of of Christ the name of the Lord if you if you reject what God tells just like many people did many people rejected and were judged of God back there they none of them were judged eternally there was no eternal judgment under the old covenant. Uh, they'll come up in the resurrection of the unjust if they died unjust. There's where we, we, there's where we have to look at um, uh, the, the resurrection. Uh, everyone that lived prior to the early church that were just, resurrected in Matthew 27, 52. After Jesus' resurrection, they came up in a resurrection there because they were just. There, we can't find anybody just in the final resurrection. After the thousand years, there's two groups of people there that Revelation 20 states that the sea gave up the dead that was in it. Let's just take that for a minute. The sea is the world. Revelation 17 shows us its peoples, nations, and tongues. That's the world. That's not the body of Christ. It's not God's people. Um, well, it's, it's the ungodly world. There's a, the ungodly have never known God. That's number one. Now, there is such a thing as that, that, Paul called an ungodly sinner. And he that, he that knoweth to do right, and doeth it not to him, it's sin. So if you're, uh, if you're an ungodly sinner, you're one of God's children. You know to do right and you're doing it not, but you're in the world. You're, uh, you're living with the ungodly. You're living an ungodly life as a sinner, not as an ungodly person, but as an ungodly sinner. So the seed gives up the dead. There's nobody in the world that's ungodly 
that's going to stand in judgment. The ungodly stand not in judgment. So they're not going to resurrect either. They've judged themselves unworthy for a resurrection. But God's people, there's multitudes of God's people that's in the world. That's There's different reasons, but they're all unjust. Some of them are victims. But a victim still doesn't have the crutch to stand on to say, I choose not to serve God because I was done wrong. No, because I'm a victim. Well, they're God's children, but they're not just. Uh, and so there's a lot of people that that are in the that are in the world, the ungodly world. They're out there in the world, but they're God's children. They're all going to come up after the thousand years in an unjust resurrection. Here again, <laughs> Brother Linegar used that analogy. They they'll have to stand before the Supreme Court. They haven't had enough of the truth presented to them or manifestation of God presented to them to where they could be eternally judged until they meet that Supreme Court judgment, so to speak. So when they resurrect, they're going to see that. They're going to see it and hear it. The full manifestation of God, a sevenfold light. And it looks like when you look at the 20th chapter book of Revelation, that the, that the the majority in multitudes will reject God in that because they go down in a in an unjust spirit and they'll come up in an unjust spirit and many of them will not be changed and they'll set up a divisive, divisive group of people to rise up against God and try to judge the people of God and God will kill them. And what he calls the battle of Gog and Magog down there, where God just kills them. It's, you know, Magog is the land uh, where the people of God will slaughter. And th that's just using that analogy of the Old Testament to show what's going to happen to those that reject God in that final resurrection. Then the next, the next, uh, those, the others that are resurrected, see, give up the dead that are in it, and death and hell gives up the dead that are in them or in it. That, that, now I think you have to stay in the book of Revelation as far as symbolic wording, phrases. The, the, the fourth seal was the pale horse. The rider of that horse was death and hell followed with it. And there's the death and hell you have, I think you have to use that death was the Catholic church. The writer of that system was the Pope. There was no life in the ministry of the priesthood of the Catholic church. They could not produce life. It took, it took Martin Luther to march out with a message of faith to produce life, a message of life, a, an anointed message. There wasn't any anointing in that uh, uh, priesthood of Catholicism. And hell followed with it. That was the hellish condition of religion that followed with the Catholic Church, that the Catholic Church produced all of these daughters. Uh, she's called in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, the mother of harlots. She's not the only harlot. Her daughters are harlots. And that's all of these organizations that's been produced by her. Each organization took what revelation of ref reformed understanding of the word of God. They took that, but they kept everything else their mother gave them. Same, same order, same government. Pretty much. In other words, they, they just rehashed, but they, they built systems of man. They were taught that. It came even by attrition, you know, just naturally to follow what was before you with only making what changes you saw that needed to be made. 
uh, so that death and hell gives up the dead that's in it. So uh, God's people, that death is reigning in their life. Uh, I, I told this preacher yesterday, I said, there's people in your church, my church, or, you know, the Little Rock Church, and every church in the body, that death's reigning in people's lives. They're, they, they're not living a dedicated life. They, they're, they don't, Christ is not first and foremost in their life. And they know they're, they're they know they're living in sin. Uh, but they're still, they're not in the, they're not in Babylon and they're not in the world. So death is reigning in them. And, but then hell, there's people out there in a religious system that will die out there unjust. They'll come up. There's people out there that are just too, that will come up in the just resurrection. And if there's nobody just in the, the sea, death or hell, then there has to be another place to be a, uh, a resurrection of the just. So, you know, we years ago got the idea because, you know, Paul said when he was talking to Felix, wasn't it, that he he was called in question of teaching the same thing that the Jews believed in, both the resurrection of the just and the unjust. And somehow we got the idea that that's one resurrection. But there was a, only a resurrection of the just in Matthew 27, 52. There wasn't anybody unjust came up there. These were people of faith. And in the early church, and there's where we changed on the fourth chapter of First, Corinth, uh, First Thessalonians, where Paul told that church in Thessalonica, obviously their question was, what if we don't make perfection and we die? And so he answered them this way, don't sorrow for those people that die as if they didn't have any hope. For uh, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, them also will God bring with him. When Jesus comes again, he's going to bring those people that died just in faith they, he will bring them with him. The dead, he said, the dead in Christ arise first. We won't prevent them or we won't go before them. Um, there's another consideration where you have to consider that it takes a restored church or divine order of God like the early church had for someone to uh, resurrect. And to even make it. There wouldn't be any reason to resurrect them before that. It wouldn't be available to them. But Jesus would come and, uh, and uh, how does it say it in the, with the sound of a trumpet. That's talking about the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, the last prophetical hour. He would come with that sound of a trumpet and the dead in Christ would rise first. But those of us that lie are alive and remain at that time will be caught up together with them in the clouds. We're, that's not talking about literal, but we'll be caught up in a seven, second heaven condition with them of a restored church where that's the holy place. That's, that's, uh, the garden condition. We're going to be caught back up into a righteous place where we can finish the work of God. It'll be made available to us at that time. We get accused in, in teaching something like this that we're taking hope away from the people of God saying they can't reach perfection right now. Well, if you're not striving to do everything you can do in righteousness, then you're not even going to make this place we're talking about. 
if we're not striving to live a righteous life and do all we know to do, we're not going to qualify for a just resurrection even. So we're not taking anything away from anybody. Um, we're, at, we're making, we're actually saying there's a whole lot more people can make the bride than what's ever been taught. But it's going to take a restored church for that to happen. It's going to take a resurrection of the just for that to happen. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to cover this subject of eternal judgment. I'm really dealing with this sin unto death. That's, that was the question that was posed to me. And I, I got in here tonight a little bit early and I thought I need, I'm going to have to look up some of these scriptures, but I had forgot that I'd already made all these notes on it. So it saved me quite a bit of time. Um, I've read to y'all um, those that are full age in Hebrews 5, 14. Strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those by, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So there is such a thing as full age. We go back to, uh, here the 12th verse, Paul says, for when, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and be, become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of God, righteous, for he's a babe. So there is such a thing as being a babe. That's one of the things I might have to talk on before long. You know, there is there there is a teaching that's a little bit of a false teaching if it's presented like some have presented it, where to be in Christ, you've got to be living a, a above sin or a righteous life. And that's just not true. The Bible, you, you can be in Christ and just be a babe in Christ. There's such a thing as being a babe in Christ. And you're certainly not capable of living up above sin if you don't even understand the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness in, in many things. So you can be in Christ. Now it's Christ in you is our hope of glory. Christ, the the birth that Christ gives us in the Holy Ghost, that's the hope of reaching glory and, uh, you know, the glory of, of righteousness, full righteousness. All right, let's see if there's anything else we want to say right here. Again, if anybody's got any questions, feel free to ask them. I'm, I'm trying to cover... Again, I'll just mention, let me see here what this is. First Corinthians, I mean, first John 2, my little children, these things right unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He, he just starting off there. And of course that covers babes all the way through uh, the, the righteous development of a person that if you do sin, you've got an advocate with the father. He's a propitiation. He, he'll forgive you of your sins. He'll help you overcome uh, certain sins. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we don't want to try to project that you you got to live above sin without sin until you've reached reached that place. We're just showing the ultimate uh, place, and we shouldn't be trying to project 
you know, this eternal judgment that God, you know, God is wanting. God, the last thing God wants to do is eternal, ju eternally judge anybody unworthy of life. He wants to eternally judge everybody worthy. You know, there's two sides to eternal judgment. One makes you eternally worthy of eternal life. That's eternal judgment as well as eternal judgment that judges you unworthy of life. But you got to reach a certain place in that. And so uh, this early church John was talking about, they there were people that reached that place, that reached a place that was either worthy of eternal death or eternal life. Anyway, I hope that I'm making myself plain in what I'm saying. I'm trying anyway to do that. Um, I'll stop screen sharing. Okay, does anyone have a question? If you do, it's a good time to ask it. We may we may not come this way again for a while. Uh, Brother Smith. Uh-huh. For clarity, I, I meant to say in the Ten Commandments, God told Moses not to take the name of the Lord in vain. And it seems to me like that might have been one of the worst things child of Israel to do was to just disregard uh, God's power, God's name in their day. Seem in, in the same way as the rest of blasphemy and the Holy Ghost takes it a step further, sure punish when we be eternally that, that was trying, that was a parallel I was trying to make. Yeah, I don't think you could use that in parallel with what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 12 or Matthew 3 as far as sinning against the Holy Ghost. Um, let me see if, and I think you're, I mean, I'm going to get back to what you're saying, but I want to make it clear to those that may not be really getting what I'm saying is what I'm saying is, is that the early church and the restored church will have such a manifestation of God that if you grow to a place to where you've developed in receiving the full measure of that sevenfold light and you reject God during the hope or his eternal judgment there, which there was no eternal judgment in the under the law or there before Christ came to this world. But you could, under the law, you could take God's name in vain. In other words, you could claim to be one of God's chosen in Israel and yet not even come close to living a dedicated life under the law of Moses. Many people did that and did take his name. In other words, they claimed to be a part of God's chosen and his elect under the law, but yet they didn't live that, they didn't live that by faith at all. And therefore they 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 carried his name in vain. And that was, there wasn't hardly any greater sin than that, to, than to, to claim to be one of God's chosen and live the life of a devil. And there were plenty of people like that in, in, in Judaism. Uh, uh, plenty of, of Jews, literal blood born Jews. And uh, so that definitely was one of the things that God, uh, one of the Ten Commandments that they were not to commit. Uh, when, you know, of course, today, I don't know when or when it, how it actually got started, where just using God's name as a curse word was equated to being taking God's name in vain. That was far from what the literal meaning was under the, under the commandments of Moses. Anyway, uh, uh, but, but yes, under the law, it was actually rejecting the awesome glory 
of God's person to take his name in vain in a similar way. You could use it in application of in the early church to blaspheme the Holy Ghost, being one of God's children and not live a life of faith. But it wasn't, you, you probably hadn't reached a place of eternal judgment in that analogy or application. This literal place I'm talking about, sin unto death, was a sin unto eternal death. John said, I, I don't say that you would pray for that. I don't know how you would know necessarily that a person had sinned a sin unto eternal judgment. Except if you watched a, while, a person, I think you could tell God took his hand off of them. God, God backed away from them and, and turned them over to Satan. Still, you'd have to, you know, there's people today that, that I've seen turn from righteousness into devils. And then I've seen them turn around and come back to God. So sometimes it can look like a person, God's finished with them, but he's not finished with them. So, uh, you know, it just looks like they're, we have to leave that up to God. But I would, I would say this, that if I, a person has had a tremendous amount of knowledge in the early church or in the restored church, and they turn away from God, I, I, I don't know, I might would be a little bit fearful about praying for them. I just have to turn them over to God. You know, there's people that I pray for that are today. There's, I've got enemies I pray for that I want to see them saved. I don't think that they've reached a place of eternal judgment at all. You know, but you have to reach a certain place in God where you can pray for your enemies, don't you? you no. Know, the Bible says to love your enemies. That, that takes a certain growth in God. And I've had people that are my enemies that I didn't, I, I didn't, <clears throat> I could be honest, I'd have to say I don't love them. But I'm starting to get to a place where I can love the person and hate the sin and love the soul and want to see them saved, you know, because I know there's something there. I, I know like the Lord knows that there's something among in that person's life that it could be saved. They've shown it. I've seen it in their heart, you know. I can't say that about everybody that I don't know close enough, but anyway, um, yes, Sister McNabb. You mentioned a couple of, uh, last week or the week before that um, I'm believing it was the beginning of the 15 years that we're going to have to discern the true ministry. And you're talking now in regards to the fullness uh, when the church is in its fullness, when the, it's come alive that way is is there a span of time between that between being well, able to discern that yeah like what, what you said when i think it was i'm not sure if it was the last 15 years that when we come up it's we're not going right into a perfect ministry we were there was going to be other um uh, here's what i said i remember what i said let me okay let me what I said was, is in the restored church, which would be in the last prophetical hour, 15 years. I said that there will be all manner of flesh in the restored church. I said there are going to be thousands of new people come in. There's going to be new ministers in. You will have to discern. You'll have to discern who is the true ministry of this body. Who really is the leadership? And you'll have to grow into a place of that discernment. There's people right now that don't know. They don't know who the leadership of this body is. They might know. They might could pick out, you know, some of them, but they may not know. They may have a lot of confidence in somebody that's not a leader at all, really got a lot of problems in their life. But they carry themselves in a way that they depict someone that might uh, be in leadership, but they may not have the fruits of, of truth and leadership or righteousness in their life if you really got to know them. 
And what I was saying was, during, just like for an, during the, like John, here John, he was in a righteous uh, uh, divine order of God in the early church. And here John said, he said, believe not every spirit for many false prophets has went out from among us. Uh, there was false prophets in the early church. John said in another place, he said, they, they went out from among us. They were not of us or they wouldn't have went out from among us. But at some point they was with us and it looked like they was the part, but they left. So they really wasn't a part and really didn't have what we th thought they had. Well, he was warning the people, just like I mentioned in the letter to um, Ephesus in the one of the seven letters written to those churches, seven churches in Asia, book of Revelations, chapter two. He said, you have tried them that say they are apostles and found them to be liars. And I equated that with the 20th chapter of the book of Acts where Paul told the, the elders at Ephesus, after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in spoiling the flocks. Then he added, who are they? Men of your own selves. He, no doubt that I would venture to say that some of those men that said they were apostles and found to be liars were some of those elders that Paul was talking about in Acts 20. I, it, it's reasonable to consider that anyway. So there's men that are among us that are elders that they weren't true men of God. They failed somewhere along the way. The people in Ephesus tried them and found them to be liars. They had enough discernment that church did to know that those weren't true leaders in that church. And they proved it. They had enough proof. And, that, and that's I was using that to show that that we, even when the church is restored, there's going to be there's going to be thousands of people, babes in Christ, and every level of growth in God in maturity unto perfection. That as you grow, you're going to have to discern. You'll have to develop and discern where are we? Who am I? Who's leading this? Who, who really has the mind of God, the power of God, and the anointing of God that's leading this body? Just like right now. Right now, I believe that there are men that are elders in this body that have the mantle to carry this body on. Then there's younger men that's coming on underneath their ministry, but they don't have the mantle. They do not have the mantle to carry this body right now. There's men that's got that mantle to carry this body. They've got the message, they've got the authority, and they have the influence, the voice to carry this body. But there's other men that don't have the mantle. They'll get it, but they'll have to grow into that and get that mantle. And this ministry, as the, the leadership of this ministry, will have to help them to receive that mantle because that somebody else has got to, this mantle has got to fall on somebody to carry these people on. And they will. God, God's never been without a leadership. He's never been, he's not bankrupt. God will always have a ministry, but you got to understand how it works, you know? And so uh, I've, I've said this many times to the church that's been under my ministry, I said, until you grow to a place where you really know who you are, you're not thinking too high of yourself, but you're not thinking too low of yourself. You really understand where you're at in God. And you know the church. See, when I first came to the body of Christ, I thought you people were way higher than God than what I found out you were. I found out y'all had a lot of problems I didn't know you had. I, I thought, man, I'm coming so late, I just I probably ain't gonna make it. 
all these people nearly made the bride, but I, I found out it wasn't all that great. It had a ways to go. And when new people come in among us and they really get a vision, that's what they think. They think, man, this is wonderful. These people are great. They stay long enough, they find out there's problems in this church. This church got trouble. There's people in here that ain't even living right. <laughs> there's, you know, they finally figure out where this church is and where the people in this church are. Who's the leaders? Who's the elders in the ministry? Who, who are the examples and saints? And until you get to that place, you can't be very effective in a church. I mean, you can be effective. You can be in the band. You can be a singer. You can be a lot of things, but you can't lead that church until you really know where that church is at and where you're at in it. And that's really what I'm saying about a restored church. Once this restored church comes, you're going to have to be able to discern, you know, who, who's leading us. What's God saying to the church? I mean, there's going to be people that are babes that ain't got all that figured out yet. They're just enjoying, you know, a child. You know, a child, when, you, when, when you're a parent, you've got children, those children are dependent upon you. They haven't reached a place yet of becoming uh, responsible for their own actions and moving into an adulthood where they're no longer fully dependent upon their parents, but they're starting to answer the call of responsibility in their own lives. And that's what I'm saying about saints. We got to grow to a place in the body of Christ that we enter a place of responsibility and we become effective in our walk in God and our position in the body or whatever church we're in before we can be very effective in that church. Because if I'm looking at things that's not real, you know, if I'm thinking that this person over here is higher than what they are and I'm giving them more influence in my life, I'm not, I'm not too developed in my growth or that person wouldn't have that much influence if they're really not that developed or righteous themselves. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I, I can tell you when, you know, you got a church, new people come in, you know who they're going to flock to? They're going to flock to the weaker people. If they're not very strong themselves, they're going to join up with people that they don't feel so judged getting around them. But you get around people that you see or have a real quality of righteousness, you, you're a little bit fearful about getting too close to that person. But they're over here's a person that their life is a looser life and you can feel more comfortable around them. It's kind of like little children. Little children don't feel good around older children. They're going to find somebody their age. So it works the same way in the body of Christ. So anyway, I hope I'm making myself maybe a little bit more clear. Okay, before we go home, let's, uh, let's pray for Brother Bill Daniels, I'm asking God to touch this man. He's in our church. He's got congestive heart failure. Uh, he, he just suffers every day, just get through the day. He can't get the fluid off of his body. He's a good man. I really am asking God to be merciful to him and give him a little more time. I don't want to lose him, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just, Asking God, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of being like the little widow woman, the unjust judge. I'm just keep talking to God about it. See if he'll, if he'll, you know, even if he has to say, I'm tired of hearing Brother Smith talk about this. I'm going to heal Bill Daniels and get this guy off my back. <laughs> I know it don't work just exactly that way, but Jesus did say we could pray that way. And I don't see a reason why I can't ask God to do that. If the Lord deals with me, I'll shut up if he deals with me to be about it. But right now, I am just feel comfortable about asking God to consider Brother Daniels. And I'd like for you to pray for him with me. Then Brother, Brother McGowan is really suffering with bronchitis. Uh, I don't think he's got COVID. Uh, I think he'd be dead if he had COVID by now. <laughs> he's been sick on and off of this so long. And he just, you know, he's just not. It's just, he has this every year, about this time of year. So 
pray for Brother Wayne McGowan. He's he's just suffering right now. Uh, uh, let's see, what else do we need to mention? I wanted to continue to pray for Brother Dale Stripe, his family. Brother, I I heard that Brother Myron Anderson passed away today. Somebody else hear that? I think it was. On. Yes, sir. That's true. It was yesterday, I think. Yes. Okay. Yesterday. I yeah, would think. Also for that, Sister Crow. Yes, Sister Crow. Remember her. She's not been able to come to church for a while now. So we sir, want to miss her too. Um, what else? Let's see. Pray for the work in the Dominican Republic. God's doing, there's several things happening over there that's good. God's blessing them over there. I'm, I'm planning on going over there for too long. Pray for the work in Mexico, Brother John Bud's works. They're, you know, they're doing good. Uh, there's some needs in Mexico, in the Mexico work. The ones in America, I think, are doing good. But anytime a man, a brother Bud's caliber passes away. It's hard on his works to make the adjustments of losing him. So we'll try to remember those in your prayers. And then, of course, Brother Goss in Keswick, Canada, and the, uh, you know the works there in Canada. Uh, you know, so pray for Brother Goss. He's he's still he's still with us in the middle us, but he's 80. Is it 84, Sister McNabb? 88. 88? 88. I, he came to church on Sunday. All right. Well, I know, you know, uh, because of his age, you know, his, his health is failing him. But, you know, we do want to pray for the Keswick Church and, of course, Brother and Sister McNabb and his family. I mean, Brother uh, Goss and his family. And then Sister McNabb, it's not been that long since Brother McNabb passed away. And I know it's not easy for her. So try to remember her in your prayers. It's not easy to live alone without a spouse. You've been, you know, Sister Smith and I have been together 54 years. I don't know what I'd do without her. Uh, I, I had a customer here this evening. He was 84 years old. Him and his wife have been married 63 years. And uh, I thought, wow. And they bought a dog. He said, we thought we was too old to get a dog, but then we decided, you know, we're, we ain't going to, it don't seem like we're going to die anytime soon. And he said his, his kids was lived right here in Maumel, Arkansas, which is just outside of Little Rock. He said, I just decided we need a dog. And we, we only been two years, our whole 63 years that we ain't had one. So he said, I decided if we died, them kids could have to just have to take care of that dog. That'd just be part of their uh, problem. But I'm going to enjoy me a dog while I'm still here. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, I told him I was 72, and he said, you're just a kid. I said, well, I'm just 12 years kid behind you, but <laughs> thanks for the compliment. I'll, I'll take all of it I can get. And that right by the tally. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm chasing Brother Tally. I'm, I'm uh, glad, you know, he, but. God you know, you, Smith. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, brother, just one minute, Sister McNabb, brother, brother uh, Fidel in Guatemala City, Guatemala. He's got the only church in Guatemala in the body. He came up under Brother Day's and was in Brother Day's church for a long time, but he actually never got was able to get his papers, and he wound up having to go back, and he started to work over there. His, bro his brother passed away yesterday with COVID, I believe it is. He's on all of my Monday night. Uh, I have several Spanish people get on our Monday night, uh, Dominican Republic. Um, Zoom meetings like this, and he's on every one of them. And uh, so he asked us to pray for that family, his brother and, and their family. He's a young man, brother. Fidel, I would say he's in his 
probably 50 maybe you know that that's kind of you know i mean my son's 53 and i don't think he really likes for me to call him a young man i remember when brother william waters got up and told the ministry on airline drive and in Houston, Texas, he said, brethren, we have a promise to live under three score and six and 10. That's 70 years old. And, and 10 by reason of strength. He said, I'm 35 years old. I'm, I'm middle-aged. Please quit calling me a young man. He was just 35. <laughs> So um, I know that men that are 50 don't feel like they're, and they're not, they're not young men. I didn't feel like I was a young man when I was 50. In fact, I felt like I was pretty, pretty, pretty much an adult when I was in my late 20s or 30. But I did realize as time went on that I, I, I maybe had a few more things to learn in life. Anyway, if y'all turn your, microphones on and let's pray together for these needs it's mentioned in all of these assemblies and the needs that those assemblies are i know that all of you have have needs precious lord oh god thank you lord Oh, I to understand you in a greater way. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, God. Touch Brother Daniels tonight. Yes. Brother Ray yes. Weaver, Sister, yes. Sister Crow, Brother Goss. Oh, yes. God. Thank you, The strike yes. in that church yes. in Montana. Uh, Mon uh, thank you, Missoula, God. Montana. Those saints were under Brother uh, Strike's ministry, Lord. God touched the work in the Dominican Republic, Mexico, yes. the Johnny Butts, Blake, Blake, those assemblies, oh God, touch his blood, oh God, your ministry. God, I pray for your ministry, our leaders in this country. Oh, God, this pandemic, God, help us to survive and, and get above it to overcome. Oh, God, to do your work. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right. God bless your hearts. Text me if you want a copy of this recording. I'll send it to you. Uh, or if you want a copy of those notes that I had, I'll give you them. Too. This is the head. Of